Hi, welcome to Veladco part three. In the previous lecture, we mentioned that the data that was coming through PigChamp uh, just wasn't consistent with what our projections were. We were beginning to get worried. But um, a month or so later, we, we began to see that we, yes, we really should be worried. Uh, our, our actual results were far off from what we had projected. We were in trouble. So yes, the storm clouds had been brewing and now the storm hit. Um, so we realized that a new three year financial projection was needed. This was a major task. Uh, I, I put together a spreadsheet that linked uh, different feed rations with all the different kinds of production assumptions we talked about before with prices and all that. Just a multi-page linked spreadsheet, uh, which was a ta major task for me because I, at that point, I really didn't know how to use spreadsheets very well. So it was a learning process, not only on the technical details of the company, but also how to use the, the software. Um, but we, we did put together a, a very, very useful tool. Now, I, I'll tell you about the great deal of work this, is, uh, this was because one of the things you need to know as a startup that sometimes uh, the hours you need to work are enormous. Uh, you, there's no one else to turn the, the task to, so you just need to buckle up and, and get the job done. Um, so you know, facetiously, uh, we say that... Uh, we had very, very flexible work hours. We could choose any 70 hours per week that we wanted to work. So, uh, but we did get that done and uh, we were able to make projections and uh, we could see that we had to do some very significant things. One of the problems that we had was, uh, was disease in our herd. Um, we knew going into this that disease problems in a pork production system can be devastating. When you have uh, 8,000 or 10,000 pigs on a site and you have uh, 20 to 25 in a pen eating out of common uh, feeders and so forth, a disease can come into the herd and uh, spread like wildfire. Um, but initially we weren't that concerned about it because working with DeKalb, which is the supplier of our breeding stock, um, we, we knew that they had very stringent biosecurity measures, things that we did to try to keep disease uh, organisms out of our farm. Um, and uh, so we thought we were at the cutting edge of those techniques. Our facilities were long distances from other pork production facilities uh, because we knew that uh, you know, some of these organisms can, you know, be transmitted from one farm to another through the air, sometimes as much as a mile and a half through the air. Um, our facilities were shower in, shower out. You, you took your clothes off, you took a shower, you put on your barn coveralls and, and boots, and then you went into the farm. Coming out, you took your shower, took your coveralls and boots off, uh, showered and put your civilian clothes on and went out you went. Uh, that again, so uh, designed to keep um, all the uh, organisms away. If you had been in a, another pork facility, pork production facility, you could not even go into the barn for three days. So uh, there were, we went through quite a bit to try to keep the bugs out. Um, when the new animals were brought in, they would go into what's called an acclimatization uh, well, barn, separate from the main barn. So they, the veterinarians could monitor those, see if they were sick or whatnot. If they were sick, they weren't brought into the herd. If they were okay, then they were brought in. Um, and uh, so, you know, we went through a, a lot of uh, effort to keep our animals healthy. The, the, the truck that delivered the feed would actually go on the outside of the fence and with a, with a uh, conveyor tube would then put the feed into our feed bins that were in, inside the fence. The trucks never entered the farm. Um, all the, all the trucks that came in to pick up the weed and pigs or the ones that came up to pick up the market animals were pressure washed and, 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 and sanitized, uh, didn't disinfected prior to coming onto the farm. Uh, we even owned our own feed mill in cooperation with a couple other cooperatives. And 
uh, so that we could monitor the biosecurity measures at, at the feed mill, trying to make sure that it didn't, the disease didn't come in through the feed. Um, but nonetheless, we got hit by a, a disease called PERS, is porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. Um, it's a reproductive issue in that uh, sows would get, uh, when, they're, when they're pregnant, they would get to about day 109 of the 113 to 115 day gestation period, and then they would abort dead pigs. And as I might have mentioned before, you know, one of the key things you really wanted to do is you wanted to you know, minimize your non-productive sow days. And 109, 109 days of being pregnant and then not delivering kids, uh, the, the little piglets, um, that, those were all non-productive days. So very, very devastating when it comes to production data. The respiratory problem was um, that uh, PERS acted a lot like AIDS, and that the, the PERS itself didn't really kill the pigs, it just opened up the pigs to other organisms, uh, particularly uh, one of the you know, flu and, and uh, atrophic rhinitis, which would just eat up the pig's nose and, um, and almost like a just hollow nose. It was really a, a nasty stuff. So we would have 10 to 15 percent mortality in our finishing barns, and Obviously, with sick pigs, uh, your feed fish, she wasn't very good either. So the problem was there was no known cures for PERS, and it was very difficult to prevent, as the viruses that could be spread through the air for over a half mile. I mentioned uh, a mile and a half. That's been known to happen as well. So bottom line, we lost millions of dollars. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. So that was a problem. So next we're going to talk about the uh, legal uh, issues um, because any new company needs to develop uh, or decide on what their form of business. And we, we talked uh, before about that and we picked the agricultural cooperative form because that was a very beneficial way for us to do it, um, limited liability and pass through taxation. And we also had a, a attorney who advised us on securities issues, uh, you know, when we, when we issued new stock and uh, whatever went beyond, beyond my expertise. I was an attorney, I, you know, as I could tell you before, I graduated from Stanford Law School. But one of the things you learn is, is in any business, the law of, in that is so specific that unless you are practicing it all the time, it's hard to stay abreast. Uh, so it's best to use your legal expertise to really formulate the questions that need to be answered and then answer the, the lawyers uh, those uh, very, very specific type questions. So another part of legal is really a lot of the human resources forms and, and practices that you need to do to stay legal there. So we did that in-house. Um, we had some, some advice here and there from outside, but we did, we did that in-house. So um, another legal issue is how the company is managed. Because uh, we showed you the organization chart and uh, you know, I was president, but above me was the board of directors that were elected by the members of the cooperative. Um, they were very, very helpful to me very early on in my tenure because I had so much to learn. Uh, and so they, they were extremely helpful. Um, but as we, as we went on, it became a problem because they were micromanaging. They were uh, in the office an awful lot. Uh, so one of the things that you know, we really enjoyed was planting and harvest season because then the farmers were very, very busy on their farms. And then we could actually get, get work done. I estimated at one time that I was spending about 40% of my time either meeting with the board members or getting ready for those meetings. So, um, so uh, the, the boards are responsible for company oversight and policy making. So obviously they're very concerned when they found out, you know, we were not meeting our projections. Um, but when they go beyond their role as a director, uh, then uh, it makes it very, very difficult to pay managers to do their jobs. This is an issue with company after company. This is, this is not new or, or just only Valadco. Now, there's one a writer and his name Daft who defined the five stages of growth as, as startup, survival, success, takeoff, and resource maturity. Um, unfortunately, we got hit with the PERS uh, very uh, early on, and we never got past the survival stage. We, 
uh, we would like to have said we were, this is a very successful organization. Uh, we did an awful lot of things right, uh, but in the end, we failed. Now, one of the common problems of startups is transitioning from the entrepreneurial stage to a management stage where a different style of leadership is needed. Um, in the entrepreneurial stage, things are very, very creative and, and things are moving very, very fast. And, but in the management stage, you need to get down to just creating systems of work or doing things efficiently. When you start having to do things over and over and over again, you want to have a very efficient way to do those things and ways, of the ways that you can train new people how to do those things. So um, another way of describing these steps are, are planning, which is very early stage, organizing, getting things together, leading, uh, in, in, in getting things put together again uh, and in controlling then that's really managing or watching the day-to-day -day activities uh, checking to see or whether the uh, business is is, is uh, hitting the projections or the goals of the company um, and then making adjustments as needed so um, entrepreneurs don't always have the technical skills or temperament to do the planning, organizing, controlling aspects of the business. So that's where experienced managers are hired to do those. However, if the entrepreneurs do not step back, uh, they can make the manager's job, again, very difficult. Just like, just like the board of directors can make it very, very difficult uh, in, in, a, in, a, in other kinds of startups where the entrepreneurs are hands-on in the business early on. Uh, it, it takes a different kind of style the ultimate oftentimes to then manage a larger organization. But one thing the board did extremely well is work as a, a very effective decision making process. They, they were good at uh, brainstorming and we had a big whiteboard uh, in the meeting room that we they would just we would write stuff down and go discuss uh, options and pros and cons and writing all these things down. Um, and they had very, very vigorous discussion and sometimes debate. Um, but what, one of the things they didn't do is they didn't get stuck on one chain of thought. Uh, they really encouraged out of the box thinking uh, to avoid groupthink. So, and they were not afraid to decide and there was no uh, paralysis by analysis. Uh, they, they, they worked very well on that. Um, but the unfortunate thing is these discussions oftentimes would stretch for hours and hours and hours uh, particularly in the winter when they were not worrying about planting and harvesting. That's, that's why we enjoyed planting and harvest season so much. So, so uh, these, these were a bunch of good men. Uh, it just, uh, we, we failed. One problem that I couldn't get the farmer members to, to take seriously was how much the pig barn smelled and created odor issues for the neighbors. Um, in, in the lagoons, the anaerobic lagoons we used, uh, anaerobic is you know without oxygen and so uh, the, the manure would be pumped into into these ponds and they would sit and, until they would be pumped out uh, and to be applied as fertilizer on the farmers fields. Um, unfortunately that manure as it sat there would would decompose into some really really noxious chemicals and odors and uh, sometimes these odors would begin to just kind of flow out almost like a river a plume uh, and, and flow down and out of the out of the lagoon and down uh, toward neighbors' houses, and it was really really noxious. Uh, that was really a problem. So w you know we were, we looked for solutions to that. Now uh, one one possible solution were the, were were plastic covers for the lagoons. Uh, another option was to be, uh, to really introduce an awful lot of. Uh, uh, air into the system, that would be the aerobic generating pits. Uh, and when that's done, there's an entirely different chemical process, which, which makes uh, very little odor and, uh, and uh, it's a really good process. Unfortunately, it, it destroys the, 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 the um, fertilizer value of, of the manure. So um, it changes from ni nitrates to nitrites and the, the nitrogen in the, in the, in the uh, in the manure, so that's that's uh, that's why the farmers didn't like that, uh, as well as the additional cost. Now there is to is to really with a cover or whatever to put these manure through an anaerobic methane generator to generate methane, which could be burned in like a like a diesel or not like a in 
a caterpillar engine, for example, uh, and to generate electricity. I've seen that done in a 3,000 cow dairy. Uh, it looked like a, like a good option, uh, but we never could take a board, get the board of directors to do any of these kinds of ideas. They, you know, they sort of had the idea that well, farm smell, and, and under the laws of most of the states, United States, they what they call right to farm. Uh, neighbors can't shut down a farm for for because it has odors and so forth that that farms ordinarily have, uh, but you know most farms aren't of the size that we had so we were we were out of the norm uh and they never could uh, get to that point um so uh the the problem was uh, obviously neighbors were complaining and they got the minnesota pollution control agency involved uh and the, the ladco after i left was uh, fined a quarter million dollars uh, for the excessive odors so um because Minnesota and many other states had increased their security over you know, what are CAFOs, uh, concentrated animal feeding operations. Um, it, was, it was an issue not only in Minnesota, but elsewhere. So, so what did we learn out of all this? Our, our mission uh, was to produce the highest quality consumer ready meat product at the lowest possible price. So we looked at the two ends of things. One was the quality side, and one was the price side. Um, how we tried to minimize the cost, we had huge economies of scale. Uh, we had properly sized production facilities to maximize the throughput per dollar facilities to minimize average fixed cost per pound of pork. We had modern genetics to maximize litter size and lactation ability of the sows and the leanness and rate of growth of the boards. So we, we had good genetics and we used uh, training uh, manuals and, and training methods for our employees so that they knew how to implement our production system very well. So we attempted to maintain our herd health through very rigid biosecurities. Uh, we tried to minimize our feed costs by having our own United Mills feed mill. Um, and, and then uh, we, there's a real, an expert uh, lady, and actually she's an autistic person uh, from the University of uh, Colorado State University who came to our facilities and really viewed our facilities and made suggestions on how we could uh, minimize the stress on our animals, uh, which would then would improve uh, pigs weaned per litter and improve rates of growth. By the way, Temple Grandin has designed um, about 50% of all of the uh, uh, slaughter facilities for both, both pork and beef in the United States. Uh, basically, he's designed the, the holding chutes and, and the, and the uh, ways the pigs go up, up to the point of actual being slaughtered. Because the real problem is when pigs get, or animals get very, very excited for just, uh, just before uh, being slaughtered, uh, they have a whole bunch of uh, hormones and stuff that are pumping through their body and ultimately makes uh, a lower quality meat. So um, that was very, very important. And we otherwise used all the latest research and refining our methods uh, based on that. We tried to maximize quality. Big push in the industry was to have lean pork. Uh, and by using the best boars and the best genetics, we were able to have very lean animals that, uh, that grew very fast. We used artificial insemination, again, to have the best one or 2% of the boars. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned before, uh, we don't want to have the pigs excited in the, in the slaughter shoots uh, at the slaughter plants. So one of the ways to eliminate their getting uh, so excited is to have herdsmen mingle around with the pigs in the pens so that they're used to having humans around them. And music seems to seem to also do a good job of that. So, and there's also things you could do in the last 10 days of before they, we brought pigs to the slaughter plant uh, in terms of their feed that would uh, also improve the quality of the ultimate consumer ready meat. So, um, we had planned to adopt uh, a, a, a new or uh, genetics line called the JSR line um, because the JSR line had been uh, really developed so that it would not have the stress gene. Um, now the stress gene is a recessive gene, uh, which if 
if through the, the maternal side and the paternal side they got together and both of them had the stress genes to the point that their offspring had two of these stress genes, um, oftentimes those pigs uh, would get very, very excited in the shoots to the slaughter, at the slaughter plant and could actually die. Um, not only would there, you know, those that didn't die could have uh, poorer quality meat, but they would have deaths in the shoots and any pig that died prior to being actually killed uh, in the slaughter plant, you could not use their meat uh, under uh, food and drug regulations. So, um, you know, that was, we, we were really trying to get a better meat. Um, and I'll talk a little more about that in a bit here. Although Vladko was vertically integrated closer to the consumer uh, by its membership in farmland industries, um, we were still exposed to price volatility for the products it produced. I mean, we were trying to avoid selling corn at a low price because it's far from markets uh, and in the fluctuations in the, in the raw product of corn. Uh, but we changed, we went from one commodity product corn to another commodity product pigs. Uh, and although we went through a cooperatively owned slaughter plant, the returns to the farmer were still largely dependent on the price of the market price for pork. So we didn't avoid uh, that price volatility like we had hoped to. Um, and the pigs that we didn't take to slaughter that we sold as market, uh, excuse me, as, as breeding stock through, Vela, through the Kelb, we received a market price plus a gilt premium. So obviously as the market price went up and down, um, so did our, our price that we received go up and down. So, so our goal of fully capturing the value of higher meat quality was never really accomplished. Uh, um, as the returns from farmland industries was diluted by the meat quality of other producers. So our initial financial projections were, projections were overly optimistic. Not only did we not realize the low cost that we hoped primarily because of the PERS epidemic, um, but we never got the, really got the premiums that we wanted on the quality side. Now, you, you can say, okay, what could we have done differently at the start of this whole venture? Um, we could have improved our analysis um, by running various sensitivity analysis uh, of our projections. Our sensitivity analysis is, is you systematically vary some of the assumptions little bit by little bit and see what the difference in results is. You do that uh, you know, over many variables and soon you begin to see, okay, what are really, really the key, key variables? Um, and obviously if we had done that, the, the liters per sow per year would, would have really kicked in big time of showing that, as well as the death rates, uh, mortality rates in our finishers and our, uh, and our nurseries. Yeah, um, I should go back and say that uh, we, we were looking at our internal rate of return because in our spreadsheets, we, we calculated out 10 years and based on our projected results, that's where we came up to where we were showing a, about a 20% internal rate of return. Well, wow, and we knew that was really big, um, but we thought we were on the cutting edge of the industry, industry in transition. Um, we thought we, we were ahead of the curve. We thought we were um, really going to make it big. So we were obviously overconfident about our biosecurity measures. You know, despite all the things that we did, one of the big weaknesses was we had nothing to stop disease coming in with the animals that were coming from DeKalb. And it turned out that our supplier was the source of the PERS um, and there was not much we could do about it. That's where we were getting our animals. So we needed, we needed to, to stock our farms. Uh, we didn't want to rock the boat too much with the cow because we were selling our animal, our, our, our breeding stock, our gilts, um, back through the cow. And so we made a big, big stink about it. Uh, we'd, have, we'd have lost that market for some of our, for our animals. So we were in a bind. So had, had we conducted a very cigarette, very vigorous SWOT analysis, we might have identified the threat that we overlooked. Because obviously, when we look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, um, the, the threat of PERS was the bomb that blew us out of the water. So, um, 
Now the SWOT analysis is a very important part of a business plan and uh, this is something we never did um, a, formally uh, in, our, in our planning for Valadco. The strengths uh, we had, we did have, we did have some strengths. We had experienced production management. We had strong outside advisors from DeKalb, veterinarians, and, and so forth that we talked about before. We had an energetic board of directors. Uh, they were good people. We had financially sound farm owners. Most of our, our 100 corn growers that we bought our stock was very, very, very well financially sound. So. Um, we had cor low corn prices uh, locally uh, that we were trying to raise the value for. Um, we, had a, we had a contract with actually membership in Farmland Foods to get closer to the consumer because they slaughtered our animals and, and had, had consumer brands that, uh, that were very good brands. And we had a contract with the Calp to sell the selected gilts at a premium. So this was, uh, you know, we, we, we were not, uh, you know, without our strengths. However, we also had weaknesses. Our board of directors and, and myself as president, we were on a steep learning curve. Uh, this, this, is, this is a lot of new stuff for us. So we had to develop the systems, the training program, the financial projections, the accounting system, human resources. Uh, an existing company would have had all that already in, you know, done, built. So. Uh, our obvious weakness was our biosecurity measures against the disease brought to us by DeKalb. Um, we were unable to escape the market variation for, for pork prices. We were never able to fully capture the value for our higher quality that we produced. Um, and obviously when, when things really went south, when we went bad, uh, we had insufficient capital, uh, equity capital to withstand the problems we experienced. And um, we were also still a fair distance uh, to market at the farmland industries where we had our slaughter plant. The opportunities we had were really what we were trying to seize. We were, we were attempting to be one of the leaders in the evolving industry from small to large producers. We were one of the, we were going to be suppliers of the genetics that many of the commercial producers needed um, in their, in their uh, breeding programs as, as the industry transitioned from farms producing their own breeding stock, replacement breeding stock to um, to purchasing them. Uh, we had huge economies of scale that we could, that we could capture the economies of. Um, could we pr properly sized all the components of the system to really minimize the cost per animal that we ended up producing? Uh, so the, those were those are good opportunities. Uh, and we also obviously had the ability to produce uh, the high quality pork demanded by the ultimate consumers, not only the leanness, but the, the good quality of meat. Now, obviously the, the, the threats uh, uh, was the major disease PERS, which as I said before, was the bomb that blew us out of the water. Uh, we had the environmental issues concerning odor, which ultimately cost uh, the cooperative a quarter million dollars. Uh, market price for pork also collapsed. Uh, at uh, one point, the price for pork was you know, $50 per hundred weight, and it dropped down to eight at one point. And right about the time that I left Valadco, we also had a huge price uh, increase in corn. Um, uh, where the price of corn had been about a buck eighty a bushel, dollar eighty a bushel. It went up to near five dollars a bushel. And and with corn being one of the major inputs. Obviously, that was very, very damaging as well. So, when we really looked to wrap this uh, this analysis up, um, uh, I really, as I sit back now, I wonder why we thought we could start an organization that could compete with the largest and best in the industry that already had all the systems, technology, and expertise in place. Um, and this was a common problem with many of those value-added cooperatives that I mentioned earlier that were happening in the Midwest, uh, whether it be the Southern Minnesota Sugar Beet Cooperative or, or the uh, ethanol plants or the, the plants that would make uh, corn syrup. Um, you know, we, the, all these new startup value-added cooperatives were competing in the marketplace with already large established companies. So, 
uh, in the Corn Sweden area, uh, Archer Daniels Midland, ADM, uh, was a major, major uh, producer of not only corn syrup uh, uh, and high fructose, high fructose corn syrup as well as uh, ethanol. So, so it was a really think back about it. Uh, would joint ventures with such companies have been a better option? That's something in our anal analysis we'll need to look at. Uh, it is, instead of starting a new company and learning a whole lot of stuff new, is there a possibility of a joint venture? Hmm, that might be an option we should think about. Um, so uh, those are really uh, some learnings or things to think about. Now, if what I've described in this, these series of three videos is a lot of the elements that would go into a formal business plan. I'm not put it in the form of a business plan, but, the, but a lot of the a lot of the things we've talked about would be in a business plan, whether it be organizational structure, description of the the board of directors, the industry background, uh, and all those kinds of things. Those are all all be the things that uh, would go into a business plan. But there are a few things in this earlier so far in this uh, presentation that we that would things that need to go in a business plan that we haven't talked about. Um, uh, for example, there would, it would, in a business plan, we, we really should have more of an industry background. And in this case, a number of producers by size, and the graph showing a transition in the industry, the price history of pork to show the, the uh, variation, uh, the, the price history of major inputs like corn and soybeans, beans. Uh, we, could talk to, we could have talked about the previous problems in the industry because not too many years earlier than the PERS outbreak, there had been a huge, huge problem in the industry with another disease called pseudorabies. Uh, we, you know, had we dug in more, we would have found out that the decalb animals were uh, susceptible to atrophic rhinitis right from the breeding stock company, from the decalb they were getting. Um, we should have looked more closely at the location of processing plants. We should have looked more closely at the uh, strengths and weaknesses of other genetics company. Um, so um, there were there were other genetics companies that were were, were strong that uh, were competing with us. So, and um, we should have thought more about the public perceptions regarding concentrated animal feeding operations, feedlot operations, about those odor issues. So. That's it for, for Valadco. Hopefully there are some of the things that are that in this story uh, uh, of, of uh, what looked like a tremendous opportunity for the farmers, as well as myself as president. Uh, I was really excited about this, uh, this being president of this emerging company. We thought we were on the cutting edge. It was, it was really exciting. It was exciting for me. Um, but as you can see, start, starting a new company is difficult. It takes an awful lot of work. And success is certainly not assured. So uh, it's, it's just a word of caution. Any new venture has risks. And uh, not only for the investors, but the employees. Um, so with myself, I left a secure job for this position um, and then uh, had some difficulty moving on to another position uh, because you know, having a track record of being with a failed company is not really a great resume builder. So uh, uh, in, in the company I'm, I then moved to, which, which was another pork company, uh, another pork uh, swine genetics company, um, when, when they folded, when the price went down to $8 per hundredweight, and they also got hit by PERS, um, you know, we, we had people working for on our barns that uh, they had very few other employment opportunities in the area. So when we failed, um, what do those employees uh, do? Uh, so this really has not only a, a financial impact, this really has impact on the people involved. Uh, the investors in, in Valadco, some of them invested um, you know, a million and a half dollars in, in, in the Valadco, and if, when they lost it all, uh, that significantly affected their farming operations. Uh, that hit their balance sheet uh, really hard and made fin getting financing for their operations more difficult. It made difficulty paying off their loans. Um, so 
we really need to consider not only the financial aspects, but the people aspects of, of these businesses before, we, before they're started. So with that, we'll see you next time.